So um, hopefully there'll be something interesting for everybody. Um, so I'm going to give this talk is really a uh, almost a tutorial introduction to microwave photonics. Um, so if you're familiar with microwave photonics, um, it'll, it'll probably be pitched perhaps a little low. If you're not, hopefully it will actually introduce the topic relatively well. Um, in, in any case, feel free please to interrupt me um, mid-talk and, and just ask questions because you'll get the most value out of me. I've got, I've, I've got a lot more information to, to impart it than I've actually got up on these slides and sort of getting it out of me is probably asking the questions is the best way to do that. Okay, so. Um, just an overview, um, I'm going to talk about um, microwave photonics in the context of electronic warfare. Um, and that's sort of uh, a bit now for something completely different. But um, uh, there, there are um, digital communications uh, applications for microwave photonics, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention those in passing. But I'm, I'm going to sort of stick to electronic warfare as a, as a context for this. Um, and then I'll introduce microwave photonic links, um, the concept of them, talk a little bit about optical, optical transmitters, um, just pointing out that the, the things that you, there's lots of things you probably know about them. Um, there's a few things that are important when you're dealing with analog information um, that, that maybe, maybe you're not so familiar with. Um, talk about optical receivers um, very, very briefly. Um, then talk about the things that are important for analog links, um, link gain, bandwidth. Um, noise and dynamic range. And this concept of dynamic range is very important for electronic warfare. And then I'll talk about opportunities and limitations. So this is really a this is really a sort of general introduction. My next talk talks about a number of um, research uh, uh, topics that, that we've explored in the last few years and most recently with, with Kudos using nonlinear optics. So uh, this provides a platform for, for that next talk. So Electronic warfare. Electronic warfare is essentially all about radar. So, um, and radar is essentially radio detection and ranging. And so, what you're doing is you're sending out an electromagnetic pulse into the environment and listening for when that electromagnetic pulse comes back. And by doing sort of fancy signal processing, um, you can you can get a lot of information about um, how, it, how far away the thing that reflected the um, the signal is. Um, which direction it is. Um, if you've got a rotating um, antenna, you can you can scan the sky, and that's essentially what you're seeing. What you're seeing here is that it, this is the radar signal from an antenna that's rotating, so it's in, in sort of cylindrical coordinates. And you can also get other information like the size and shape, and and um, also the velocity, um, trajectory, lots of information about the um, about the. Uh, metallic object that's out there that you're, you're perhaps trying to look at. Um, and the, the, to actually analyze that information, you can do that uh, graphically by just simply looking at what you're, what you're seeing out there. But um, in modern electronic warfare, there are computers that basically crunch those signatures that come back and basically start tell you, OK, that squelch out there has got to be this type of jet fighter because it's got all the right signatures. So, so we're 80% sure that that's what that is, or that's a missile because it's going too fast, or something like that. So, so you know, essentially have computers that, that basically turn those squelches into actual known threats. There's a database that they look up for all the different signatures. And what we're trying to do with electronic warfare is provide those computers with the best information we can so that they can, as quickly as possible, come up with a, a definite identification of the threat um, so that you can uh, do something about it. So um, the, the idea here is that there's, there's radar. So a lot of threats, not only missiles, um, use radar to guide them and to um, track um, the things that they're trying to hit. And so it's useful to have systems on board if you're uh, an aircraft, for example, that's likely to be targeted by a missile, um, uh, something for detecting whether there is a radar actually tracking you. And so um, this is what's called a, a, a electronic warfare, a, electronic warfare warfare uh, radar warning receiver. So it's a warning receiver that tells you that there's a radar that's locked onto you. And associated with that is the idea of countermeasures. So uh, the count, usually what happens is that the uh, radar warning receiver gets the computer to suggest, okay, this is the threat, 
this is what I, we suggest you do. There's, there's a, a countermeasure that's known to work against this particular threat. Um, common countermeasures are, for example, here you can see deployment of flares. They're very effective against infrared guided missiles and infrared guided uh, things, so heat seekers. Um, there's also chaff, and, and so there's, there's some chaff in that. And chaff is essentially just cut up little bits of tin foil. So it's basically you just deploy lots of metal into the air, and suddenly you used to be an object this big, and now you're a huge cloud of metal. Um, so um, that confuses um, radar things. So those are very simple countermeasures. There are um, also much more complicated um, uh, countermeasures. There's, you know, bang out of the way, move, um, eject. Um, there's a really extreme one. And there's some automatic countermeasures. There's some really, um, okay, you've got about two seconds before this thing hits, and so it will automatically eject you um, uh, as, as, as a countermeasure. But that's pretty exotic. Um, there's uh, other countermeasures where essentially um, you have um, counter countermeasures. So um, here's an example of some radar warning receivers. So um, defense platforms, uh, ships have, have lots of them. Ships have, have, have lots and lots and lots of electronic warfare um, equipment on them. Um, planes more so, uh, although there's issues with having lots of uh, big radar dishes and things sticking out of airplanes because they're not very aerodynamic. So this is what um, those sorts of antennas on, on aircraft look like. And here you can't see any antennas at all, so uh, you've certainly got them, you just can't see them. Um, so um, there's, there's a whole uh, lot of different solutions to doing electronic warfare. And a lot of it has to do with how much weight you can carry and how much bulk you can deal with. And on, on ships, not a problem. Um, the further up masts you go, the lighter and lower profile you want to, things to be. But on aircraft, you really can't have lots of things sticking out on the aircraft, so you're, you're sort of limited in, in where you can put your antennas. So um, th this is this is a, a sort of an interesting engineering platform to look at to try and uh, place um, antennas on. Um, so these radar warning receivers have got to be sensitive. They've got to be able to detect threats from as far away as you possibly can. The, the, the further away they, that you can detect them, the more time you have to respond. And so, like banking out of the way and, and avoiding the threat completely might be an option, uh, rather than actually deploying one of the countermeasures. Um, the other issue with these radar warning receivers is they've got to be really, really broadband. So, like 2 to 40 gigahertz, so really, really broadband. Um, that doesn't mean that the radar pulse itself has that bandwidth. They're not ultra short pulses that have got a good, enormous bandwidth. Um, the issue is that you just don't know. You don't know what frequency the radar is going to be using. And it could be agile, it could be popping around in, in that frequency range. Um, it, it really anywhere from 2 to 20 is, is, is fair game. So the radar signal could literally be anywhere from 2 to 20 and dynamically moving around in that space. Between 20 and 40 is becoming more popular. It's, it's challenging because um, RF um, systems don't, don't work particularly well at, at those frequencies. Um, and also, the, once you start getting up to those sort of millimetre wave frequencies, the distances you're dealing with, you're not really sort of looking at hundreds of kilometres, you're looking at hundreds of metres. So um, they're really for very fine targeting um, applications. I've heard of examples where um, there's missiles that use low frequencies to sort of get to the target, and then high frequencies to lock onto your fuel tank, for example, so uh, actually pick parts of the aircraft to actually lock onto. So um, again, it's important to have uh, electronic wolf warfare uh, radar warning receivers that can potentially detect the entire suite of, of, of threats and ideally you want to do that all with one system. Ships again, you can have dedicated systems for all sorts of different frequencies because you can have dozens of antennas. Um, I'm told that the um, uh, larger aircraft can have up to 100 antennas on them um, and um, ships must have many, many more than that. So. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of antennas, but um, the cost, the weight, is, is a significant um, issue, particularly for aircraft. So, <clears throat> you have um, sophisticated signal processing, as I mentioned, to identify the threat type, database lookup, look at the signatures, threat location, find out, you know, as precisely as possible where it is, find out what speed it's going, find out what its trajectory is, is it actually heading towards you, or is it going somewhere else? That's, that's key to what, what you're trying to do. Okay, then you've got counter countermeasures. So you've got, um, you've detected that um, something's locked onto you, you do a countermeasure, 
Um, the, the threats themselves can then do an, a counter countermeasure to try and actually knock out your ability to see the, the radars locked onto you. Really simple version, jamming. So, um, for example, here's this rather ancient uh, picture of um, all these aircraft jamming these radars so they can't see the aircraft up here. So this is this is essentially uh, you have aircraft that are just booming out really really intense radar pulses and, and trying to um, knock out um, either the radars or the radar warning receivers. So you're trying to essentially blind the radar warning receivers with this really intense um, uh, jamming signal. And that's equally as important as being sensitive. So you want to be really sensitive so you can see the signal as far away as possible. But also, you don't want to be so sensitive that as soon as you get hit by one of these jammers, all your electronics explode. So um, you, you've really got to be, um, uh, have, have, um, Techniques to overcome, overcome that. So, requirements, broadband, very, very sensitive. Um, so, um, they need to have a low noise and a high gain. Um, and they need to have a high dynamic range. And this, this is, so they need to be sensitive at the same time as being able to cope with very, very high um, signals, uh, strengths. They also need to be quickly reconfigurable. So you want to be able to detect that there's a jammer in use, reconfigure your radar warning receiver to say, OK, well, I, I, I won't uh, point my most sensitive equipment at that jammer. I'll, I'll point it away so that it isn't being harmed by the, by the jammer or confused by it. Um, or I've got, I know there's a particularly important threat over there. I'll, I'll direct all of my resources in that direction. So you, you want to be able to dynamically reconfigure these systems, and um, uh, that's, that's something that's important. So what does this look like? What does this look like? So here's, here's just a really uh, simple example. Um, so one of the larger aircraft. Um, basically, uh, this is actually a practical example. In my second talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, some work that we've done on, on this sort of platform, where you have four antennas um, at the wingtips, at the nose, and at the tail. And the distances, the direct distance between these can be, you know, 30, 30 metres. Um, when, once you actually go sort of routing through that, it could go up to 50 or, 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 or more metres. Um, but the idea is that what you want to have is something fairly simple out of the wingtip. And all of your um, sensitive, um, sophisticated uh, signal processing, your computers for uh, looking up the databases for the threats, all uh, inside the aircraft, where they're not going to be sort of disturbed by the electromagnetic environment or um, you know literally sort of physical attack. So you want to have this sort of protected environment. Um, also, it can get very very cold out there, um, and you don't want to have to sort of have a temperature control out here. You want to do all your um, environmental stabilisation at one place here. So you've got to essentially remote all these antennas away from the central processing unit and and essentially have cables of the order of about 50. Um, so, electronic warfare is a little bit different to um, communications in that the distances you're talking about are, are almost always less than a kilometre. Um, so, so, um, so, the dispersion is not really an issue in that, in, in that regard. Okay. So, what about our cable? So, this is, this is, this is what, what's my solution for this 50 metres of, um, of link? So, um, RF cable. Okay, that's um, fairly well established, um, or um, RF waveguides. Well, the issue with RF cable is it's good for short distances or low frequencies, um, but it suffers from conductor loss. And so what we see here is that the transmission through the RF cable is propor exponentially proportional to the length of the cable and this um, attenuation coefficient. And this attenuation coefficient, so basically the loss grows exponentially with length. Um, and that's a problem. So for a few meters, no problem. Get up to 50 meters, it's a, it's a big problem. Also, the attenuation coefficient increases with frequency. It increases with the square root of frequency. That's a typical uh, response for uh, product loss. And so here you can see sort of a typical plot for a, um, a uh, 50 meters of RF cable, and what you can see is that this cable isn't designed to stand 50 meters, so you've lost about 40 dB of your signal um, at 10 gigahertz, but it's okay at relatively low frequencies. 
So this sort of um, attenuation of high frequency signals just really isn't acceptable for um, electronic warfare. There's a lot of important things happening out here at 10 gigahertz. You want to be able to pick it up with, with just about as much sensitivity as you've got this sort of um, lower frequency. Uh, so this, this is the reason why you can't just um, sort of plonk a, a, a cable between your antenna and your central processing unit. So what are your solutions? Well, your solutions are reduce the frequency, reduce this attenuation coefficient, or remove the conductors. So, um, amazingly, the current solution is to reduce the frequency. So, what they do is basically have um, an antenna, have all these front-end electronics that essentially takes your nominally 40 gigahertz signal, or usually 20, mixes it with a whole lot of local oscillators down to baseband, so you take your band from, say, 10 to 12, and multiply that by an 11 gigahertz signal and mix it down so that it's now a 2 gigahertz signal. And you would do the same thing with your 8 to 10 and 4 to 8 and, and, and a, whole, a whole range of different bands that you're dealing with. And then run multiple lines that are now all just carrying 2 gigahertz uh, signals down to your central processing unit. Okay, so it works. Um, and it's out there. This is, this is actually how um, aircraft for decades have been, have been dealing with this problem. Um, the, this this uh, technology emerged um, in the Second World War, so uh, this, is, this has been developed for many, many, many decades. Um, so what are the issues with this? What, what, are, what are the problems that we're trying to solve? Well, the issues are that the cables are really, really heavy. So for gigantic aircraft, um, it's okay. For battleships, not so much a problem. But for um, uh, drones and uh, really small light aircraft, you really just can't afford this um, this, sort of, this sort of weight. Um, mixing equipment is also heavy, and it's out on the wingtip. So weight out of the wingtip is much worse than weight in the body because it sort of unbalances the aircraft. So that's that's an issue. Uh, the front end oscillator is noisy, so you've got a whole bunch of oscillators out here connected electrically to an antenna. This is, this is not a stealth um, uh, arrangement, basically. It's quite possible for this um, quite strong signals from these oscillators to leak out through the antenna and essentially tell um, a, a threat where you are. So um, it's, it's not, it's, they're, they're quite noisy and there's a lot of um, electromagnetic leakage. And um, perhaps most important, the front end mixers are very sensitive. So um, particularly high frequency, if you're trying to do mixing at 40 gigahertz, absolutely, but if you're doing mixing sort of at 20 gigahertz, those uh, electronic components are, are, are very, very uh, delicate um, to be able to operate that, that fast. And so if you hit that with electromagnetic pulse, um, like a jamming signal, it's quite possible you'll actually permanently damage those, those bits of electronics. So that's one way of electronic attack, is to, is to essentially try and knock out that front end mixer. So this is one of the reasons why uh, people are interested in photonics, is for electrical isolation. So, um, the other alternative is to, is to remove the conductors. And so, this is, this is the approach that's uh, currently being adopted. Uh, you have an optical transmitter, and there's a few different options for this optical transmitter um, attached to your, to your antenna. And then you have a photonic link, optical fiber. Um, it's about 50 meters, um, so it doesn't have to be particularly good quality um, optical fiber um, to um, hold a 40 gigahertz uh, broadband signal. Then you've got all your optical receivers turning things back into electronics at the central processing unit. Um, it's got lots of advantages. Um, lightweight, um, it's about 4% the weight of um, the equivalent optical waveguide, bandwidth of optical waveguide. It's about 10% the weight of RF cable, and you only need one of them. So one fiber does all 40 gigahertz as we were before with the RF cable. We needed multiples of them to do them in two gigahertz chunks. Um, it's truly broadband. Um, at these sorts of lengths, the loss really is just independent of RF um, frequency. So we, we don't care whether we're dealing with a 2 gigahertz signal coming in here or a 40 gigahertz signal coming in here. Uh, the fiber is just essentially uh, a, a conduit that goes through. Um, look, you know, if, you, if you're getting up to sort of hundreds of meters, um, <coughs> then uh, it's a static dispersion and things start becoming a problem. But really, this is just a simple conduit. Um, it's got electromagnetic isolation. That's a really important um, aspect of these things. Rapidly reconfigurable. Um, the light is very easy to uh, manipulate uh, very, very quickly. Um, and you can multiplex parallel signals. So you, you can actually put have more than one antenna 
multiplexed onto a single fiber, um, again, in the CPU, and it helps you with the waves and the bubble and uh, all those sorts of things as well. Okay, so, just to broaden a little bit, um, what I'm talking about here is antenna remoting. So this is um, one of the applications of microwave atomic links. It's basically antenna remoting, um, it's good for satellite systems, radio astronomy as well, um, as well as electronic warfare. Um, antenna remoting is also good for um, true time delay. So it's, um, you know, phased array antennas, anything that needs a precise time delay where you don't want to have a lot of dispersion. Uh, RF cables are really dispersive um, compared to optical fibers. Um, or uh, a lot of loss that depends on the RF frequency, um, uh, then uh, often the microwave type things are, are really the, the thing that we want. Um, distribution of radar signals, so not just detecting, detecting them, actually distributing the signals to power amplifiers to um, uh, transmit them, and um, for fiber wireless. Um, I mean, there's a whole field, um, there's a whole field of um, fiber wireless that uh, I'm not talking about. And essentially, um, my understanding of fiber wireless is that this is where you basically take a nominally digital signal from a base station, you don't know anything about it, you treat it as an analog signal, you modulate it onto an optical carrier, you transmit it out to an antenna that also doesn't know anything about the digital format, um, and just, just turn it back into electronics and broadcast. So this is, this is a, a proposal for things like uh, picker cells where you might be um, transmitting a radio signal within the room at about 60 gigahertz. Um, it would be very hard to transmit um, to a, a, a transmitting antenna over anything but fiber. Um, RF cable is just not going to work at 60 gigahertz. Um, certainly not in the size of a building. Okay. So, the transmitters. Um, options are direct modulation. Um, this, is, this is cheap. People don't really do this for microwave photonics, um, and I'll get down to that uh, at the moment. So, microwave photonic uh, links basically uh, give the option of direct modulation or external modulation. Um, direct modulation is where you essentially just adjust the bias of, the, uh, of a laser diode. So, you're, you're, you're just essentially switching the laser diode on and off. It's not digital, this is analog. So it's important that the laser diode is, is linear. So you're working in this linear regime of the laser diode. Um, so you can see here, you've got an analog signal coming in. So this could be any size and uh, nominally um, uh, a very broad range of frequencies. And what's happening is that the voltage or the, the current is being swept up and down this curve and the optical intensity of the output here is varying in response to this. So if this is very linear, then this optical intensity that comes out will be a very faithful reproduction of what came in. So that's what, that's what you want. Um, the um, advantages are that uh, direct modulation is cheap, it's really simple, and actually it's got pretty high gain. So the, the slope on this curve is, 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 is quite good, so you get a lot of change in the um, optical intensity for a very small change in the uh, electrical input. Disadvantage, of course, is that the wavelength changes with, uh, with signal. Um, uh, this can be a little bit noisy, um, and they're very sensitive. There is sensitive electronic component. If, you're, if you've got this attached to your antenna, it's very hard, easy to fry this with an electromagnetic pulse. So it sort of undoes a lot of the advantages of your um, microwave atomic link. And they're also bandwidth limited. So for relatively low bandwidth um, applications, these are good. But once you're pushing up sort of 10, 20, 40 gigahertz, um, you really can't very much of that so the other option is to use an external modulator, a Maxeter modulator. Um, basically, here you have a stable laser, so you have a nice um, stable laser that's being modulated by a, a Maxeter modulator. Um, and a Maxeter modulator is essentially an interferometer. So what you're doing is basically you have two arms, you're changing the phase between these two arms um, using an electronic material such as lithium niobate and then adding them back together again. And so when the two arms are in phase, you get um, a, a peak, so here, for example. Uh, when the arms are out of phase, you get a null. And where you want to operate is at this uh, quadrature point here. So you want to adjust without any electrical bias. This is where you would be operating, so both the arms would be in phase. You apply an electrical bias to basically add a DC voltage so that without any signal coming in, you're naturally at this point, so one arm is a little bit out of phase with the other. And so now when a signal comes in here, the, um, 
the light basically traces this curve, so you get a relatively faithful reproduction of the input here. So the advantages of this um, are that you get a very, very broad bandwidth. These are, um, are, are extremely broad band. There have been examples of these done up to uh, over 100 gigahertz. Um, 40 gigahertz is, is certainly commercially viable. Um, they're pretty immune to electronic attack. Um, essentially, there aren't any sort of semiconductor components in here to fry, so um, it, it, it's, 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 it's um, difficult to use an electromagnetic pulse and, and actually permanently damage um, one of these. So they're good for electronic warfare applications. Um, disadvantages are they're relatively expensive compared to just direct modulating a laser. You need a laser and an external modulator, and um, it can be sort of difficult to, to package these. So I think the prices of these are around about $1,000 now, so it's not it's not too outrageous. Um, uh, they're relatively low gain. There's certainly nothing like um, uh, the um, uh, direct modulation in terms of gain. So this, is, this is really the Achilles heel of these uh, external modulators is the, is the gain. And they're nonlinear. Uh, this is not so much a problem for uh, digital modulation, but in analog modulation, if, and particularly in electronic warfare where you might be um, being jammed with a really high intensity signal, it's important that if this signal gets too big, you don't start wrapping over um, this response and start getting harmonics coming out um, in, in, in this signal or um, uh, mixing. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. So this is, this is, these, this, these two things are really the, the big issue with external modulation. Um, so, if the signal is really large, um, the nonlinear response can create new frequencies. So, here you've got a, a picture, um, and this looks very much like four wave mixing um, or uh, nonlinear uh, interaction in optical fiber. These are RF frequencies, though. These are the frequencies of your electrical signal coming in here, and the fact that the modulator response is essentially a sinusoid instead of being a straight line uh, gives you. Um, if, if you're perfectly biased, it gives you a third order modulation, an odd uh, nonlinearity. But if this bias drifts, so if, you, if the bias moves around and it does with temperature, um, then you can end up with this second harmonic appearing as well. So um, you can get both um, second harmonic generation and um, uh, third order um, uh, intermodulation uh, distortion, which looks very, very much like four weeks. So, um, what we care about, we, we don't care so much about the second harmonic. There's, there's lots of good techniques for removing the second harmonic, you know, simplest of which is you can just sort of filter it out. Limits your bandwidth to a, uh, a uh, octave, but um, you, can, you can probably live with that. Um, there's other more smart, smarter techniques for, for dealing with that. Um, but you can't really easily move, remove the intermodulation products. So if, if two intense components in your um, RF signal mixed together through this nonlinear component to produce these intermodulation products, essentially that's the noise. That's the noise that you, that you, you, can't, you can't deal with. So um, this, this basically presents an upper limit on the input power and it affects your dynamic range and what sort of intensities are likely to blind you. So very quickly about uh, receivers, um, just to complete the link. Um, these are generally pin photodiodes. Um, Broadband, uh, bandwidth isn't so much an issue. These are readily available up to 70 gigahertz. The big issue with the high frequencies is actually getting the RF out, so the connectors are the, are the, are the bother. Um, good responsivity, so you know, about 75%, so 70, 75 milliamps per, uh, per milliwatt is typical. Um, you know, you can get 80, 85, 90 sometimes. Um, uh, limited power handling, the higher up in frequency you're going, the smaller the active area is the less power these things can handle. And um, as you'll see shortly, power, being able to handle lots of power is important. So um, that's a problem. And also, the small active region means that they become delicate. They become um, uh, components that are likely to actually break um, uh, in the environment, you know, sort of static and things like that can actually sort of damage these things. Um, although, for microelectronic links in electronic warfare applications, not so much a deep problem because this is in the nice environment inside the core of the aircraft, so this is this is okay. Uh, they can also introduce noise, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So um, 
Microwave atomic links are characterized by several parameters. Link gain, um, and this is basically the amount of RF power that you get out versus the amount of power you put in. Um, and this is usually um, affected most by optical power and the gain of the modulator, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, bandwidth, this is usually limited by the modulator. As I mentioned, the uh, detectors generally, uh, high frequency detectors aren't usually an issue. The issue is usually getting a, a modulator with a, with a good bandwidth. Um, noise, noise, most noise either comes from the detector or the laser itself. And I'll show you that. Um, and dynamic range and distortion is a, is a, is a key thing that um, electronic warfare people are interested in. And again, that's, that's the linearity of the modulator at the top end and the noise floor at the other end, giving you that dynamic range of the small signal you can detect and the larger signal you can cope with without getting those third order um, intermodulation products. So, talking about link band and bandwidth. Um, what you've got here is a picture of what a typical um, 40 gig modulator response looks like. So what you can see is on this axis you've got RF frequency going to 40 gigahertz, and on this axis, um, not labelled, uh, you've got the um, gain or how much um, of the ratio between the RF signal you get out for the RF signal you get in. And you can see that the gain that you get is about minus 30 dB. So that's this is in dB. So you're losing, you get about a thousandth of the signal that you put in, so it's quite a significant hit. But what you'll see is that with frequency, it really rolls off very, very, very gradually. So you can see that, um, and that's almost entirely due to conductances in the modulator. The modulator has an RF electrode, which is made of a metal, and um, essentially all of that um, reduction in efficiency is simply absorption of your RF signal traveling along the modulator electrode. So um, it has this, nice um, uh, square root of frequency response, but it essentially gives you a 3 dB bandwidth. So, um, you know, very, very graceful, slow uh, roll up with frequency, but one big hit at the big of the input. So that you, you have to have some pretty good reasons for going into photonics to warrant a 30 dB attenuator, essentially, in the, in the line. So, um, Conversion from RF to optical essentially gives you a one-off attenuation, but once you've got that attenuation, it's, it's fairly flat with frequency. The link gain itself is comprised of this equation, and the important things to, to look at here are essentially that you have the gain is inversely proportional to the square of the V pi, and the V pi is essentially the voltage that you need to switch the modulator from completely on to completely off. So you change that a little bit, make that a little bit smaller, and what will happen is your gain will go up a lot. So this is, this is a really important parameter of modulators. Um, my belief is that essentially they're maxed out, that um, the, you, you're currently able to buy the optimal design, but you know, never say never. Um, the other important parameter that you have a little bit more control over is the optical power. So the, you have basically the gain is the proportion of the square of the optical power. So increasing the optical power um, improves the gain a lot, so you want to really push as much optical power through the system as possible. So gains are often minus 40 dB, and you can sort of see that sort of behaviour up here. Uh, this is relatively high power. Um, gains depend most on the optical power. This is typically in the order of about 10 to 100 milliwatts. 100 milliwatts is sort of on the high side. Uh, switching voltages are typically of the order of 5 volts. Two and a half volts, depending on, on which sort of modulators, but that's that's roughly uh, for lithium ion modulators where you where you where you start. Um, bandwidth is limited by conductors and modulator devices, like, as I mentioned, and it's proportional to the square root of frequency, so it rolls off pretty slowly with frequency. Any questions? Uh, yes. uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So noise. Um, Primary sources of noise, there's noise from the laser, random intensity noise, noise from the amplifier, amplified spontaneous emission, um, and noise from a receiver. Um, there's also uh, shock noise and thermal noise. So uh, uh, really, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the amplifier noise, but um, uh, noise from the laser becomes important, um, as is noise from the receiver. So, the dominant noise depends on optical power. Thermal noise is essentially independent of optical power. So on this graph you can see, this is essentially the noise floor measured in, 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 in dB. Uh, uh, dB. 
So you can see that the thermal noise here essentially is independent of the input optical power that you're using as the carrier for your RF signal. The shock noise is proportional to the power. So you double the um, optical power, you essentially double the number of photons hitting the photo detector, you double the number of random electrons that it produces, so you double the shock noise. So that's essentially um, linear with, with um, intensity. The noise that you get from RIN is essentially um, the square of the optical input power because the gain is the square of the optical input power. If the optical input power is, is moving around randomly, essentially that's giving you a squared signal at the output. So what that means is that the gain depends on the power squared, but the ring noise also depends on the power squared. So you get to a point where essentially if you just keep cranking up the power, you'll be quickly overcome thermal noise. Um, uh, then eventually it'll overcome shock noise, and that usually happens at about 10 milliwatts of uh, optical input power, maybe a little more. Uh, but quite quickly you'll hit um, the uh, ring uh, threshold, um, and these are some sort of typical uh, ring noise that you would see for DFT lasers. So good ones are minus 150 dB per hertz, um, bad ones are minus 130 dB per hertz. But essentially, once you hit that limit, there's no point in increasing the optical power any further because your signal to noise ratio is going to improve. So, you want, to, you want to deal with a, a ring noise limited uh, system. Okay, so dynamic range. Um, in electronic warfare applications, dynamic range is, is really, really important. Um, it, the minimum power is essentially the detect one end of it, the sensitivity, and the maximum power is the nonlinearity. So uh, gain and linearity are generally poor for microwave photonic links. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the gain is essentially uh, a 30 dB attenuator. Uh, the noise, however, can be very, very low. The noise introduced by a mark tender modulator is just thermal noise from the electrodes. It's got no active components. So, uh, it, it's, it, the noise in, in the system is very, very low. And so you can get to a point where essentially the, the, the dominant source of noise is actually the laser. And the lasers can have very, very, very uh, low noise. So having very low noise lasers like uh, low jitter um, uh, mode lock lasers um, can be really useful for this sort of thing. So um, what that means is that even though you've got low gain, you can have very high dynamic range. So typically the order of about 110 dB. So you can you can have uh, a set, you know, the gain of minus 30 dB, but um, uh, uh, you can still have a, a dynamic range. You can sense uh, things that are very, very, very faint um, above the noise floor. So this is, this is much better than single components in electronics. People, people uh, use uh, techniques to overcome the dynamic range um, issues with electronics by using multiple systems that sort of switch between them. But um, if, you, if you're dealing with just a single component, a single optical link is much better than a single electronic link. Okay, and so here's just an example, um, uh, a typical picture about the sort of dynamic range in uh, photonic link. Uh, there's a few important features here. Um, I've reproduced that um, uh, modulator response up here. Uh, you can see that there's um, this is the essentially the gain of the system. So this is this is the signal that you get out. So the RF output power versus the RF input power. So that's sort of um, and uh, what you're doing here is basically as you increase the RF input power you look for um, increases in the RF output power. Of course, for low signals, this is fairly linear. You'd expect it to be. Um, as you increase the RF input power, actually as, as it gets to the point where the input signal actually is the um, drive voltage of the modulator, so let's say it was actually 2.5 volts, if it had been higher than 2.5 volts, what will happen is that, the, or peak to peak, what will happen is you'll actually start going over the edges here. So your signal will be so big that it actually starts going over the edges here, and that's um, called compression. So there's there's a limit on the intensity that you can put in called the 1 dB compression point, and that's this point here where essentially your signal that you're getting out is dropped by 1 dB from where it should be if it was perfectly linear due to this sort of compression of the um, of it on the area of the circuit here, uh, of the modulator. The uh, more significant limitation actually is the presence of these third order um, intermodulation distortion products. So this is essentially RF version of four-way mixing. So when you start getting these um, uh, mixing products from your uh, third order distortion, 
Um, they rise with the Q of your RF signal. So um, as you increase your RF signal, this goes up with the, with the Q. So um, it's rising faster than this one. And they actually intersect one another. And so this is, the, this is called the uh, third order intercept, where the um, linear gain, um, where the, uh, the, the fundamental actually is the same intensity as the third order um, component. But actually, you don't, you, you don't want to see any of these third order components above your noise floor at all, because they become noise, this becomes your noise floor. Um, so the basically this this is your noise floor once your power is reached above this point. So actually this the spurious free dynamic range as it's called. So the dynamic range, the smaller signal you can detect here above the noise floor, and this this should be a ring noise floor to make sure that the signal to noise ratio is as high as possible, is from the point at which your output RF signal is at the noise level to the point at which the um, uh, uh, third order product starts appearing due to this nonlinearity. And that's the span that can be up to 110 um, dB. Okay, so in summary, um, introduce the concept of electronic warfare, introduce photonic links, discuss some general characteristics of photonic links, uh, gain, bandwidth, noise, linearity, and I just want to make a comment that the uh, microphotonic links are only now being introduced in these um, electronic warfare systems. So there's a long lag behind um, telecommunications in terms of the sorts of things that are being deployed in aircraft. Um, I'll show you an example of something that's, that's sort of moderately recent um, in my next talk. Um, and by telecommunication standards, it's, it's fairly primitive. So um, some important points. Microphotonics has clear advantages over RF cabling, um, particularly lighter weight and frequency independence. That's, that's the, the two key things. Also, um, electromagnetic uh, immunity. However, you have significant loss um, in RF signal strength. So you, you're losing 40 dB of signal straight off the bat, all frequencies. Um, and to, to a lot of system implementers in electronic warfare, that's just unacceptable. It, 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 it isn't acceptable to have a 40 dB um, hit. But for some applications, you really do need it because you're, you're getting that out of 20 gigabits anyway, so you might as well, you might as well just un make it uniform across the frequency bands. Um, so you, you really got to justify carefully putting in photonic links um, to a lot of these people because you know you, 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 that, that's a significant detractor. But once you've done that, once you've actually taken that and said, look, okay, my application really needs a photonic link, you might as well use it. Now you're in the photonic domain, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with that, with that, um, that signal. So there's, you can use wavelength division multiplexing. Um, you can use photonic signal processing. You can use do filtering. You can do delays and phase shifts. You can do multiplications. You can do a lot of things in the photonic domain before you go back into the um, RF domain. And, uh, in some instances, these can be um, significantly better than, than the alternatives. And again, what you're trying to do is feed the electronics and the computers with the best information you possibly can. So, for example, one of the key things that people often try and do in the photonic domain before returning to the electronic domain is knock out jamming signals. So you want to, you want to sort of filter out jamming signals or um, reduce their intensity so that you don't um, uh, sort of hit the dynamic range of your digitization equipment, for example. And so. Some of these things are things that I've got presented in this presentation. Any questions? Yeah. Yes? If uh, we use multiple antennas, so would that affect the gain, or like the, 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 the dynamic range? Or multiple antennas. Yes. You, if I was going to use multiple antennas, and I've got an example actually in the next presentation where we are using multiple antennas, um, I would use multiple modulators. And, um, Actually, the primary reason for that is that it's very hard to get the RF signals from all the antennas into one modulator because they're actually quite small. We've tried it and it's difficult. It's much easier to have just parallel modulators. Do you see anything on the horizon that might actually uh, reduce that 40 dB uh, if you're taking um, Yes and no. Um, I've seen some fairly impressive silicon photonic modulators um, with sort of dry voltages of less than a volt, um, sacrificing linearity. 
elements are the, the you, you, you get a little bit of, it's, it's sort of starting to look a bit more like direct modulation of lasers. You've got a little bit of phase shift and a little bit of um, amplitude um, modulation. So, um, but you've got plenty of electronics handy to sort of uh, clean it up. So I, I think there are some opportunities for sort of hybrid um, digital analog um, approaches there. Hopefully that's something that we'll be looking at over the next seven years. <laughs> It's when you've got stationary antennas on an aircraft, what gives you the directional definition in your radar image? Okay, um, uh, a good example of that is there's a lot of the drone aircraft actually have antennas dotted um, along the wing, so you have maybe eight antennas, and what you what you can do is very crudely you can actually just measure the sort of time of arrival. So you know it arrives later with this one than this one, so that gives you directional definition. You can also do um, uh, phased array antennas, so um, where if, if the spacing between those antennas is actually less than half a wavelength, you can actually make them look like one big antenna that's actually turning by, by adjusting the, the delay on each of those things. And that's one of the things optics is really good at because you can have you, you need a, a fixed time delay rather than uh, a delay for a particular frequency. So that, that's very easy to do in photonics. It's quite difficult. Yeah, I mean there are other more sophisticated techniques with, um, you know, just uh, assembling in, in a computer all the signals from other antennas, which is more like what they do with radio astronomy, where you've got antennas dotted here, there, and everywhere, and you can just sort of say, ah, okay, well, I'll just ensemble those using using software. Um, they also do. Yeah, there's a question about the uh, Radar signals across optical fibers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was we used um, we used one of the first cable TV systems <laughs> transmitting four channels of analog TV. I actually deleted analog television as a uh, as a application because it's yes. a little a little obsolete. <laughs> 